Morning everyone. I was going to show you a really cool video, but I'm looking at the clock. That's probably not a good idea. So come and talk to me at Morning Tea and I'll show you where to find it on YouTube instead. Um, I work for a global missions organisation called OM and our mission is to see vibrant communities of Jesus among the least reached all around the world until one day every single community worldwide would have a community of Jesus followers among them. And depending how you think about community, like what your understanding of community is, that's already mostly true in a country like Australia. There are still tons and tons of people living in Australia who've never had an opportunity to hear the good news, that the, the amazing news that we've been talking about this morning, that Jesus' life and teachings, his death and resurrection were all to show us how much God loves us and how much he wants to invite us into a relationship with him. There's still even immigrant communities and subcultures within Australia where no one, no one within that group is following Jesus. But if somebody woke up anywhere in Australia this morning and went, I want to find out about Jesus, a simple Google search would get them a bunch of information in English or it would tell them the location of the nearest church. We've had people turn up at our church because they Googled it and there it was. But for about 3 billion of the 8 billion people worldwide, that's just not true. That's not a possible thing to do. Even if Jesus appeared to them in a dream and said, follow me, it would take, you know, that's miracle number one, it would take a second miracle for them to actually find someone who could tell them what that dream meant and how to follow Jesus. Now, I want to say that does happen. I've heard some pretty fantastic stories in the last year of Jesus doing both those miracles. He can do it come ask me about those stories at morning tea um, but it's not the usual way he works usually the way he works is through his people <coughs> so I work for an organization that's operating in about 150 countries worldwide we're a community of about people from about 70 different nationalities and what we what they're doing is in the communities where God has placed them working to see those communities of Jesus followers form for the very first time. And one of the cool things about my job is that if I, as I travel around the world in my HR role, I get to hear their stories. So I just want to share with you two stories that have really touched me and been really encouraging to me this year. You guys might remember that um, earlier this year, Peter and I went to Indonesia um, for me to be part of OM's international leaders meetings. Pete was just there for the food and the the friendship uh, and to support me but he had a great time as well uh, and we heard some fantastic stories from uh, a group working some colleagues of mine working in an African country that I, whose name I won't mention about half the people in that country are nominally Christian um, but the majority of them still follow a traditional a traditional faith system of worshiping the ancestors and then there's a significant Muslim minority and God is doing an amazing thing in that country through um, goats, which is kind of a remarkable way for it to happen. So they've, it's a very, very poor region. There's huge risk of human trafficking. There's a lot of people involved in um, modern slavery, that kind of thing. And so financial security and stability is a huge deal. So they have this great project where they basically say to a family, here's two goats. You can have these goats for a year. At the end of the year, you need to give us the original two goats back and 10% of whatever you made off the milk and the cheese that you made from the goats. But you get to keep any goat babies and you get to keep the other 90% of, of the money. And it's, it's creating a, a viable source of income and sustainability for very, very poor regional communities. Um, so, of course, everybody wants goats. Like, they, people keep coming and saying, hey, we have some needs over in our village. Like, we saw what happened. Because alongside the goats, they're also engaging with people, training them in how to take care of the goats, you know, making sure that the goats get vaccinated, starting to talk about financial management principles, and with that, inviting people who are interested the opportunity to join a discovery Bible study, just to simply read about, you know, people like, why are you doing this? And they're like, well, because we follow Jesus. So what does that mean? Well, would you like me to tell you about it? Okay, so why don't you just jump into a study and my colleagues in that area have seen, they're, they're now up to eight generations of multiplication of house churches, just in villages, people coming to faith and 
sharing with their friends and neighbours and more people come to faith and then pretty soon they're too big to fit in a little tiny village house. So they're like, okay, well you go over there and start meeting with your friends and neighbours and we'll meet here and they're up to house churches that have planted house churches that have planted house churches that have planted house churches eight times, which is pretty cool. And in, I think it's the one of the bottom, the top ten or bottom ten, however you think about it, poorest countries in the world, last year that the, the goat thing, generated tens of thousands of US dollars to help buy more goats and, and reach more villages, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty cool that I get to just hang out with people and hear their stories. Um, the other one that really touched me was a story from a Middle Eastern country. And there's a, a bunch of refugees coming out of Sudan because of the dreadful civil war in Sudan into that country. Uh, and they're, they're working both with um, the, in the Muslim communities in that country and also in the, the, South Sud the Sudanese refugee community. Um, and there was a beautiful story of God doing an amazing, or a couple of amazing things. One was um, a couple of uh, Sudanese refugees had come to faith in Jesus and they were meeting together. And then one of them got an opportunity for housing and work on the other side of the city. So, of course, you move where the housing and the work is, you know, out of a very insecure situation into a more long-term situation. And when he ended up on the other side of the city, um, he didn't have the time or the money to come across the city every week to meet back with his original group. So he was like, oh, that's a problem. I kind of need to keep meeting with people to read the Bible and pray. What should I do about this problem? And he's like, well, clearly I'll just have to tell other people about Jesus and then we'll just make a new group. So no one told, told him that he should do that and no one told him that he couldn't do it. He was just like, well, that's what they do in the book of Acts. I guess that's what I have to do. So he just started sharing with his neighbours uh, and he led more people to faith and now he's got his own group um, just because he was like, yeah, it's, it's too hard. I don't have the money or the time to go back across. One of his neighbours that he shared his faith with was another refugee coming out of Sudan and they're from two different ethnic groups who are engaged in civil war. Like that's the two sides of the conflict in, in South Sudan. This in sorry, in Sudan, not South Sudan. And this this new refugee family came in and he was like, I need to go welcome this new refugee family into my neighbourhood. Like they don't have stuff. I have I've received several different aid packages. I have a couple of extra blankets. And he went and knocked on the door of this new family and just said, Hey, um, Welcome, I'm also from Sudan, here's a blanket. And the dad in that family just started to cry. He said, but you're from, you're from the other group. Like, you, my group massacred your group. Like, why are you bringing me a, a blanket and a welcome gift? And he's like, because, because I've, I've come to know Jesus and because that's what, that message of forgiveness and love is at the heart of what I now believe. Um, would you like me to tell you about it? Okay, I'd like to hear about it. Um, and that's the kind of work that my colleagues are involved in every day all over, the, all over the world. And that the joy of my job is getting a front row seats um, to all of that. But here's the thing. That's not what I do every day. I don't have a gift of evangelism. My colleagues go to these international leaders meetings and we get there and they tell me about all the conversations they had on the plane on the way there. And I'm just, I'm just trying to like, you know... Yeah, not hit my head on the roof would be a good start, but also, you know, get through three movies, not drool in my coffee. You know, I, I am not the person that people strike up conversations with on planes. It, it just doesn't happen. Um, my background or my training is in human resources and that's what I contribute to this. So people are like, okay, why, why is that necessary? How does that work? Um, but if you just think about it for five minutes, if... If you decided to say, if you think about problem spots in Sydney, you know, where, where, is, where is clearly Jesus' work really needed in Sydney? And then you were like, I'm going to move there and be part of seeing God do something amazing there. Or if you were like, what, I'm going to move to Alice Springs. Clearly something, something disastrous is happening there. I want to be part of seeing transformation come. Or even I'm going to move to another country. Mo it's going to take a bit of effort, right? It's going to take some thought about how to go about it. It's going to take finding housing and getting jobs and getting your kids into school and finding ways to engage with people. Um, 
And that's what my team does. So we're a few steps back um, from, from the front line of actually goats and blankets and discovery Bible studies and all that kind of stuff. But we're involved in helping people get into, uh, into those communities. And I think it's probably important to say the backdrop to all of those encouraging stories I told is human suffering in a really broken world. Um, I'm, I'm telling you the, the positive end point, but the backdrop to that is grinding poverty and human trafficking and family and social breakdown and wars and all these really heartbreaking, huge issues that, you know, feel out of our, way beyond all of our control. Um, and if you're living and working in a community that's dealing with those issues, then you're going to be impacted by them as well. And if you're working to see those realities changed as God's kingdom starts to come in those places, um, then you're going to be opposed by the people who benefit from the systems and structures as they are. Um, and there's a real a spiritual dimension to that opposition. Um, and that means that there's a high spiritual, emotional and even physical cost um, for people who are engaged in that kind of work. Um, I've been looking up a lot of statistics and one of the areas that I oversee is wellbeing or people care initiatives in, in OM. Um, and so I've just been looking at mental health statistics and the mental health statistics for frontline Christian workers, the people who are doing the blankets and the goats and all that kind of thing, it's, it's roughly the same or even higher than what emergency services workers um, experience in terms of rates of depression and anxiety and PTSD because it's not just you being part of that. You know, I have colleagues who were in apartments that were damaged in the Turkey earthquake or colleagues that have been on the front line of refugee response in Ukraine. Um, and they're just, they're, he they're experiencing themselves and they're hearing over and over again um, the stories of other people. And so one of the things that's part of my role is overseeing work to support and improve the well-being of people in that those those situations so they can be well and be cared for themselves and also extend that care and comfort to others. So some of that's, um, some of my colleagues are involved in equipping people with just growing in their own self-care skills, making sure that our teams are healthy, that they're healthy Christian communities where there's adequate um, support for each other and then also providing specialist debriefing or other services or connecting people with professional help. Um, so something really specific, a couple of my colleagues are going into Russia in the next couple of months. Um, no, one, no one with a um, NATO country passport or an Australian passport or anything could go. So for once in their life, the South Africans are feeling super powerful because they're an approved country to get a visa for Russia at the moment. Um, but a couple of my colleagues are going in and they're going to spend time just sitting with our teams in Russia Firstly, just li listening to their stories, helping them to process. They're deeply grieved by what their government is doing. Um, and some of them are involved in refugee work on the Russian side of the border with the people who have fled across from Ukraine and also with the Russian communities that are bearing the brunt of the Ukrainian drone attacks um, into Russia. Uh, but also, opposing what the government's doing is not a particularly safe or easy thing to do in a country like Russia. Um, and they're not immune from being conscripted to the front lines or if they conscientiously object to going to prison um, as a consequence. So my teammates are going to be sitting with them, debriefing them, helping them work through some of their experiences, but also equipping with them with some of the basic psychological first aid skills and skills that they can use to actually be ministers of God's presence and comfort and hope in a very, a very dark and a very devastating situation. Um, and I think that's where I want to close, to say um, one of the reasons, you know, I, I hear a lot of pretty awful stories from around the world, uh, but one of the reasons that I'm still a Christian um, and one of the reasons that I'm convinced that we need to share God's love with other people is because the, at the heart of our message is that that in Jesus, God has drawn near, that we have a God who isn't apart from or immune to our suffering, but we have a God who enters into our suffering and who's with us in it. I don't understand how and why he works, that some people experience miraculous healing and Jesus turns up in dreams and 
everything gets sorted out in their life really quickly. The goats have lots of babies, you know, all those kinds of things. But And some people don't. For some people, it's a long pathway of enduring suffering. But in both of those people, experience God's presence, his peace and his provision in remarkable ways. Uh, and that's the message we have, that God, God drew near, that he suffered on the cross. Um, but even in Jesus' life, you can see that his nearness, his his weeping at the tomb of Lazarus or his comforting of people who were grieved, um, his touching people who were struggling and suffering with with illness and with death um, and with persecu- persecution. Uh, and I think that's what we have as a hope, to say, hey, we have a message of hope and comfort, not because we're extraordinary, but because our God is really extraordinary um, and he is here and we're our presence with you in this situation is just a symbol and a sign uh, of his presence with all of us. So if you want to hear more cool stories, come talk to me at morning tea or any other time. I have lots. Um, But remember the presence of God in the middle of some of the darkest places of the world. Well, good morning. Uh, <coughs> yeah, Tim asked if I could uh, kind of share and give a bit of an update of uh, stuff that's happening at Glenwood and um, uh, and being a chaplain out there. Uh, and I know, I, I guess, over the last few times, I've probably spoken and shared a little bit about uh, stuff that happens at Glenwood. Um, it's always been quite negative or there's been like really hardships and things like that, which, look, they still happen and it's still really difficult and um, there's just a, there's a lot of hurt and, and people trying to work out how to um, live in life um, and, you know, there's court hearings and things that I've got to do and, and um, there, there's, there's heaviness that happens. Um, and something I want to share within that just before I move into something a bit more... Uh, hope filled <laughs> is uh, this week uh, something threw me for a six um, and it was uh, my kind of direct boss supervisor at school um, she had said uh, we were talking about um, some of the work that I'm doing and um, and the reason why I'm doing it and, and uh, doing support raising and things like that uh, and I said well it's because I love people and I have that love coming from God and I want people to see that God lives in me and, and people can see God in the way that uh, that has come out um, by what he's done in me. Um, and she said, I don't see God in you. Oh, uh, okay. That threw me. Like, like, what does that mean? Like, uh, oh, like, <laughs> I, I, like I, I don't know how to take that. I didn't know what to say with it, but it was just like a shock of like I'm working so like hard and my whole existence here is trying to be about loving people for Christ and she's like I don't see Jesus in you at all like whoa but it did it made me uh like I I went home and I like thought about that at night because I'm it it struck me so hard in the face and it made me realize something that um that I hadn't I guess put the puzzle pieces together is that that's okay that she doesn't see that my job isn't to try and just make everything about God that I'm doing it's that what God has done in me and what comes out is what I'm engaging with God in how she sees that is totally up to her I can't make something happen I can't help her see something in a certain way that's not my job like that's something that she has to work through and decide for herself what I need to do is engage with God how God is working in me and what he's done and that's, the, that's what I need to work on, not whether or not someone else sees it. That's, that's got to do with their eyes and how they see the world, right? But at first it was so harsh that I was just shocked but it helped me understand actually that's okay that that's how she sees it because I'm not... I can't make her see anything different. So I'd st- that doesn't change how I operate because I'm not there to try and change every conversation to be about God. It's to express and to show what God's done in me and that's just how I want to live regardless how other people see it. 
And I want that to be somewhat of an encouragement to you to know that that's, it's not about trying to just make everything happen or try and make things about God. It's actually what God is doing in us just naturally happens. How we, the more we spend with him and the more time that we allow him in, that stuff comes out. And that's where I want to kind of send this message today because I just have a whole bunch of stories that I want to share with you about the hope that I have in Christ and what good has happened at school over this last year. Because this year has been tough so far. But I want to tell you about the good stuff that's happened. Um, and uh, and I'll, I know that I've probably uh, spoken about some people on here, uh, probably individually and maybe even up the front, I don't even know, and I may have used their names, but I'm not going to use their names just in case <laughs> that I haven't done that. Uh, so I'm going to change some of their names. But you'll, if you've had a conversation with me, you'll definitely know who I'm talking about. Uh, but that's okay. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about my mate, uh, my mate James, uh, my mate James, uh, who is a hairdresser. <laughs> so you probably already know that. Uh, and uh, he, I asked him to come along um, uh, to do a, a hairdressing thing at school, uh, where it's a shaving year, shave head for cancer. Um, they do it for Relay for Life. They raise money and uh, they shave the head. Um, asked him if he'd be interested to come and help with that and he was ecstatic that he could do something in the community and do something for school and I've spent a lot of time with him over the last couple of years with stuff that's been going on in his life uh, and the way about that relationship came about was a, a staff member at school who is one of my closest mates um, he he gets his hair cut every second week from him and he um, and he just noticed that he wasn't doing too well and they had a bit of a conversation uh, and he said oh do you have anyone that you can talk to and he goes not really so the relationship came from that, that he's like, well, I actually know someone that you might be able to chat with. So I've been chatting with him for, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe even two years. I can't remember how long I've been chatting with him now. Uh, and I, I see him quite regularly. I take Obi. We, we get our haircuts together uh, there all the time. Um, and uh, just recently, he's, he said that um, he wants to meet up because he wants to do a Bible study. It's like, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Happy to do that. He's been having spiritual conversations with another barber that uh, is also that he works with, um, and uh, he's a, he's a Christian guy, uh, and he uh, he's just been helping him understand things about what's in the Bible. Um, and then he's like, "I oh, know Chappie is uh, he's into that." I'm like, "Yeah, I like spiritual conversations. I'm happy to do that." So he wants to have a Bible study now, um, and so we're going to uh, meet up during the holidays, and uh, and we're going to start um, a little time together with a, with a few of us uh, and he said he's been getting mentored by a guy as well uh, and that happens to be one of the Christian students at school it's his dad that and he's a pastor and so he's been getting met so he's just been getting this information about who God is in his life and he sees it in these people that he's around um, so be in prayer for that because that is so great to see a relationship where it came from to where it is now and to see God at work within that, which is phenomenal. Um, and uh, back at school, um, there was uh, there was a couple of students a few years ago who asked to meet up with me and um, and just do a bit of a Bible study. And I was doing some some of that with them uh, for a couple of years. Uh, it was just the two of us, and then it became like six of us, and it went back to two, and then uh, another uh, girl joined um, uh, in in our group as well, and then. Both of the uh, the guy students, they've left school, they've gone to another school now, um, and the group kind of just fizzled out. Uh, except for this girl that's like, I want I, I want to keep going with it, and I get that it would just be us at like lunch, but I, I want something. Um, and I'm going to park that story just there, because I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I got asked to do a... Um, I got asked to do a studies religion class, where I got to speak to the class about um, my faith, why I believe what I believe, um, who God is. This is a studies religion class. It's run by a, uh, a teacher who's Muslim, um, and 90% of the class is Muslim. There's a couple of um, other religions in there as well, and, and there's uh, two Christian kids as well. Um, and I, we did basically a just a, a few questions that they had already prepared, which was about marriage, about divorce. That was really important to them. And then about the LGBTIQ A++ group in the community 
uh, and how do you get to heaven and things like that. Uh, and the thing that they really struggled with the most was that they didn't have to do anything. That God forgives them and they couldn't process that. And that was that was difficult for them to understand how good God is and that uh, they didn't have to earn their way back to heaven. It was something that was just naturally part of the love that God has for them and receiving of them. So from that time, and I, I mentioned it in our newsletter uh, about this time, that uh, these this was over a double period, over lunch, uh, over uh, just before lunch, it was a double period. Um, and then I'm like, all right, everyone, time to go. Uh, and everyone's like, nope, <laughs> we want to stay here and we want to keep this conversation going. And so we did it through lunch as well, that the uh, students wanted to stick around, the teacher stuck around. There was a, uh, another a staff member that wanted to be part of it, like, here, what's going on? And, and then I had, uh, it, was, it was about four or five of them, students that were there. A few of them had to go off and, and do their, uh, their prayers. Um, and I, I stuck around and we just kind of were chatting and, and talking about um, about uh, religion and, and hearing from them about what's important for them in, in how they see religion as well and who they see God. There was two students that left the group and about two minutes later, three minutes later, they came back. And they said uh, they said that we were more hungry for this conversation than for our lunch. Like that reminds me of the uh, the woman of the well with Jesus, where he says, uh, Jesus then said to his uh, to his disciples who returned, and surprised to find him talking with a woman, that no one asked, what do you want or why were you talking with her, then leaving, uh, then you know left her water jar, went back into town, and she uh, said, come and see the man who told me everything that I could, uh, that I did, and then could this be the Messiah? Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so this is where I want to bring that story back of, uh, of that other student. Um, she had been chatting with a couple of the students from that class. She had heard about it. Uh, uh, about that, about what had happened there. And so she got about three or four of them together and we met up um, last term and just wanted to, they wanted to do some kind of study, something. And so we started doing a little study uh, on, on a lunch. And they said, yeah, we want it bigger than this. I now have 36 students every Friday and Monday doing a Bible study, which is awesome. That's, that's just how God works, right? Like it's about just being available and present uh, and it's just being someone that people can talk to and, and love them in that space. So that is, uh, that's, that's God at work. It's, it's him who does it. It's, I, I haven't tried to make something happen. That was a natural thing that these students who now run it, they bring a guitar and they play worship and then, Someone gives a, gives a talk and then they pray together and they ask, what are the prayer points? The group grew from 20 to 36 in, in a week. So it, it became, it, who know, it could go bigger, who knows what is going to happen. But that came from me shutting down that group. Uh, five years ago, I shut down that group uh, because it wasn't good, it wasn't healthy. Um, and then because it was God's timing and God's way, it became something that's healthy and good. Another story is uh, one of the teachers a few years back uh, said that he had a faith a long time ago, um, but uh, it's long gone now. Uh, and he noticed that there's like different situations and stuff that I'm at school and I'm involved in um, and pretty heavy situations. Uh, and he sees that and I know the staff kind of talk about some of those things and, um, and directly in their classes that I have to speak to different students about. And it as Soph said about like the mental health side, it, it, you just, it, it does weigh a lot on you and it takes a lot out of you when you're, when you're in all those situations constantly. Um, and then I was, uh, I was making pancake mix for the Friday, which I do every, every Thursday I make the mixture 
uh, and I got a big industrial blender to make our 15 litres of pancakes mix, which we serve about 200 pancakes every Friday. Uh, and I'm there, you know, making the mixture, cracking eggs and, um, and doing it. And he's like, man, why do you keep doing this? Like, why are you, why are you doing you You were like exhausted from all this stuff and, you get, and then you want to make pancakes to serve everybody. Uh, and so I got an opportunity just to say, well, that's because of what's happening in me and that comes from God. That's the love that I have that it, it just keeps overflowing. It's like a tap that I can't turn off. While I'm here, it, um, my heart is for the school and for the people in it, and what God has done in me has changed me. And so I, that that change comes out. Uh, he then uh, he he was then asking me about some um, Hillsong songs that he used to that he used to listen to, and I, so I sent him some, and then he sent some back to me, and then I sent him a few more, and I sent him some Bible verses, and then he sent some back to me. Uh, he, uh, he then spoke last week to a colleague about how he's recommitted his life to Jesus. Um, he's getting a tattoo uh, <coughs> to, to celebrate it and he's like, oh, I've got these uh, images that I want um, and so, yeah, it's something that he's celebrating. <sighs> and it's, I feel like that was just like a, a moment of First Peter uh, 3.15, where it says, But in your hearts reserve Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And that's kind of my motto at school. Uh, it's to love people where they're at and to just prepare to give an answer. Uh, and and that's the way that uh, our family live in the community and, and, uh, and people kind of know us to be. Uh, in just being in these moments and trying to love people where they're at. Uh, I know time's kind of running out, but um, I also just want to say, look, in uh, in the last uh, few months, we've just been uh, told that we're in low support balance, <laughs> so which means we might have to step down uh, from school uh, one or two days a week to start support raising. Um, and there's a fair bit of money that we have to raise now. Um, so if there's anyone that you know of that would be interested in hearing kind of these stories and knowing what God's doing um, at school, uh, please let myself or Sarah know. We would love to uh, chat with them and talk with them about uh, what God's doing and to share the hope that we have in Christ. Thanks.